uh, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And I really think the universal part is really what we're talking about here, right? So we're not just saying for some, we're really talking about for everyone. And product inclusion really works to ensure that when you're building a product or a service, you're thinking about everyone. You're thinking about the dimensions that make them who they are and, and the intersections of how they walk through the world. And you want to be thinking about that because we all have bias and we want to make sure that we're bringing in as many perspectives as we can so that we're not unintentionally or inadvertently excluding certain types of people. And so with that, our team's mantra is really to build products for everyone with everyone. Um, there's another saying in the accessibility community, nothing about us without us. And I think that that's really important, right? Um, you can't try to assume that you know what uh, users need without actually asking them and asking them multiple times throughout the process, right? Um, I'll use myself as an example. As a black woman, I have certain experiences that affect how I walk through the world. But one, that doesn't mean that I can uh, claim to know how all black women want to be served or have certain um, products or services made for them. And so it's really integral that you bring those reflections and experiences to the table at those key points in the product uh, design process. And so that's really what product inclusion is about. And so some of you may be wondering, all right, like that's all well and good. I've heard diversity inclusion spiels before. Like really, like, like let's get to this business case that you, you know, got me into this room for. Um, so there have been other kind of studies around the business case for inclusion. So uh, BCG and others have looked into kind of why this matters past the kind of it's the right thing to do, right? We've all heard diversity inclusion is the right thing to do. And, and our team really believes it's more than that, right? That there is an actual business case for diversity and inclusion. Um, so when we look at things like um, the makeup of a team, for example, what tends to happen is that even though getting to um, a conclusion or an end result may be a little bit harder to do because people don't have uh, the same perspectives or backgrounds just because of, again, the experiences or dimensions that make up how they experience things or their points of view, um, the end results are going to be better because there are different kind of backgrounds and experiences or innovations that will come at that end result. And so, again, there is research around this. Uh, we won't get into all of it, but again, we have a bunch of experts who come from different um, parts um, of Google and YouTube who will be explaining kind of like what they've seen and, and why they believe this is so crucial. I love um, bringing receipts, as they say, so I wanted to give you some stats on uh, why this work is really important, right? And so when you look at kind of the world right now uh, and where the world is going, demographics are shifting and they're shifting rapidly, right? So when, when we talk about the business case for inclusion, I think there sometimes is a misconception um, that these are small um, demographics we're talking about and that they can be de deprioritized. And so I think what we, we want to do today is to make sure that everyone leaves with the understanding that even though some of these demographics may be in the minority, that doesn't mean that there, uh, there isn't purchasing power or these, that these aren't demographics that should be prioritized because they do have a lot of purchasing power or um, they might actually just be really big um, pieces of our population, right? So to call it a few of them, right, there's one billion people in the world currently with a permanent disability. That's a really big um, swath of the population, right? Um, 1.4 trillion, the U.S. black spending uh, power, purchasing power by 2020, right? So these are some um, stats uh, that our team looks at all the time and, and again, helps product teams across um, Google and YouTube think about um, as they're building and building for everyone. What's and name? You can I raise the sound a little myself? bit. I'm your Google Assistant. You know, the exciting thing about working on the Assistant is it's this like brave new world where we're creating something that's going to speak in a personal conversational manner. I'm Beth Sai, and I'm the policy lead for the Google Assistant. There are no rules yet because we're creating them. We had to design this character that's going to be at the mercy of the internet. People were going to say racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever stuff. So how can we you know, give it as good of a chance as it can? I'm Emma Coates, and I'm the character lead for the Google Assistant personality. My favorite part of it, which I hope someday we can have, is that it had a pet puppy gif that was just a gif. <laughs> 
part of the challenge of doing the policy for the assistant was figuring out how we can make sure that the product is inclusive, how we can make sure it's safe. So we partnered with Diversity and Inclusion uh, with Randy Rays from that team, and we partnered with Trust and Safety Search, my colleague Bobby Weber. We were trying to suss out what topics are very controversial. Things can just go wrong terribly, right? And as soon as you start thinking about that, diversity is clearly integral to this process. It makes you think a lot about how what you're creating makes somebody feel. So working with, with Randy, we went out to the ERGs here at Google, and we invited members of those ERGs to, to come in and participate in our tests. In order to really build for everyone with everyone, we need to have those perspectives reflected. I'm Annie Jean-Baptiste. I am Google's Global Product Inclusion Evangelist. Google has always said, focus on the user and all else will follow. If you're thinking about a challenge or a product, you need to make sure that you're intentional about expanding who your users could and should be. It's super valuable when you have um, enough people coming from um, a point of view. It helps us to um, keep in mind and to write for the diversity of the audience that the assistant actually is reaching. Around launch time, it was becoming more and more clear that we weren't going to have tons of user escalation. To be assistant, no news is good news. We have billions and billions of queries. We've only gotten reports of 38 queries that were so offensive that we needed to actually like take action. 0.002%. I think it's a testament in general to the, the success of the product as a whole and the cross-functional effort to making it such a safe, inclusive product. We stress test now for all of the assistant launches. We want the assistant to be you know, a product for everyone. We want the voice of Google to be something that speaks to everyone. This is probably the thing that I'm proudest to have worked on. All right, so I just wanted to give you an example of what this looks like at Google, right? So what we did with the assistant was to bring in people from different backgrounds and perspectives because they were the best position to be able to tell us what could potentially be offensive or alienating for their communities, right? And so with those different backgrounds and perspectives, um, we were able to adversarially test the assistant before launch. And as you heard, we had very, very minimal escalations. And so I think that kind of shows not only is there a ton of purchasing power and potential with diverse communities, but it's also really effective to make sure that um, you can take out potentially alienating or biased um, opinions or uh, features before you launch a product, as opposed to having to scramble after you launch something that you may not have thought about um, and having to fix it. And so before we kind of jump into our panel, I uh, wanted to leave you with three principles, the ABCs of product inclusion, which are to address the diverse needs of current and future users. As we saw, um, those stats, uh, those numbers are growing and shifting very rapidly. To build for everyone, with everyone. Again, that with everyone is the important part. And the C is to constantly test and improve for inclusion, right? Um, it's not enough just to ask um, diverse participants or users one time in the beginning if <laughs> their perspectives are needed and get that feedback. It's a constant um, iteration. Um, it'll never probably be right, but that's okay. Uh, and, and it's something that you're constantly going to have to work at, and that's the exciting part. Um, and so with that, we're going to jump into our panel. Um, and so I'd love first, um, with the first question, for our panelists to introduce themselves uh, to tell us what brings them to this work um, and what excites them about this work, frankly. I happen to be holding the mic, <laughs> so I'll go first, I guess. Um, my name is Kat Holmes. I am a UX director at Google. I joined just about eight months ago. Um, and you know, I am also the author of a book called Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design. And prior to that, I worked at Microsoft, where I built the inclusive design practice um, over a course of multiple years. Uh, the reason I came to this topic really was, um, you know, I've been working in tech a really, really long time. And, um, you know, the, there's just this explosion of diversity ways that people interact with technology today. And as I was working on um, the design of an AI called Cortana at the time, um, it was a voice-based interaction and realizing that there were a lot of people missing from the room who had expertise already in how to speak 
with and interact with computers through their voice. Uh, primarily, people have limited use of their hands and we're using speech commanding or someone who's blind and listening to their computer kind of direct where they were going. So for me, it's really been a conversation about ability-based and interaction-based diversity, and that extends far beyond um, disability and thinking just about how a human being interacts with technology and vice versa. Um, and that's just led me down this amazing and unpredictable journey of um, learning about all the different types of exclusion that happen in design and how we can help make those more recognizable. So I'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, I came to Google because you know, the, the group of people working on so many different facets of inclusion here really struck me, and I wanted to dive into that more with this community. So thanks for being here today. Hi, I'm Soumya, and I lead engineering in YouTube Music. And my interest in this topic started several years ago when I was working with the Gina Davis Institute uh, on films and helping them from the Google side to say, what kind of gender biases and gender gaps there are in mainstream media, so in movies, on screen, and behind, off screen. How are women and men being represented, and what are the gaps there? And as we were doing that work, um, I got curious to see how YouTube does in that area, because we are an open democratic platform with no gatekeepers. And unlike traditional media, we don't really regulate, I mean, we regulate in terms of trust and safety point of view, but um, there aren't really like these networks saying, this show's okay and this is a popular show, do this. It's very democratic. Um, and it was really interesting for me to find out when we looked at some of the science content on the platform, both from the creator point of view and the consumption point of view, there were gender gaps similar to what we see in traditional uh, places around the world, right? And that was very eye-opening to say, why is it that the human behavior is actually influencing something that's supposed to be an open democratic platform? Everything is machine learning based, everything is algorithms. How are machines sexist or racist or whatever biases that you see in the world, how is that coming in here? And that's when we started digging in and started lots of different efforts across Google, uh, both in YouTube and outside, where we said, let's change the conversation of diversity at Google to not just include diversity in the workforce and in our hiring practices, but expand it to also talk about diversity in our products, whether it's design and marketing and visual design point of view, or your machine learning algorithms, like what are the kind of biases that might be there, and also in testing and how you roll out the product. And so that's my uh, interest in this area and how, I, uh, how I've been involved here. And it's really exciting to see how you know, over the last four to five years, this conversation has gone from people just give blank stares when you talk to them about it, to people, there's a whole room full of people interested and engaged and really taking action towards bridging those gaps. So that's really exciting for me. Hi everybody. My name is Donald. I work in trust and safety. So Beth, that was on the video, Beth Sai, uh, she's a colleague of mine. And the mission of trust and safety is to protect the online safety of our users. And within trust and safety, I focus on machine learning fairness and ethical AI. And the way I came to this work is a couple years ago, I developed a personal passion to help as many people as possible understand the root causes of the, the biggest problems, the biggest challenges uh, in society. Things like homelessness, pow uh, poverty, mass incarceration. Um, and so there's a, there's a tie to that with ML Fairness because my mantra with ML Fairness is that in order to solve for fairness, we need to have a deep understanding of unfairness. And a lot of those issues that I was interested in helping, uh, in helping people understand, uh, they have a historic uh, basis based in exclusion and unfairness. So in order to help people understand those issues, I wanted to focus on helping people understand unfairness. So what I focus on with the machine learning fairness and ethical AI colleagues that I work with is uh, how do they get a deeper understanding of the, the history behind things that are showing up today. Things that show up, show up in data sets um, uh, origin, have an origin that is like hundreds of years ago, right? And so we, oftentimes we focus on the inputs 
um, but we really need to be focusing further back on the system that's generating the data in the first place. So that's my main kind of emphasis within uh, the teams that I work with. So I love the, sorry, I was excited, or I think it was something that might have been cat. so apologies if one want to give credit where credit is due, but around the shift you've already seen where there were blank stares before and now there are people who are interested in this topic. On that note, what do you think has brought that shift and how are you influencing peers and colleagues to think about this? And, and with that, what do you think is an inclusive mindset so we all have kind of a common language and framework to continue this conversation? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'll you won't go, you won't yeah. go. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take a start. Um, yeah, the, I think there's multiple factors. I think one is um, kind of cultural and political climate in one sense is really highlighted some of the um, dire need and made visible perhaps more of the um, uh, real impact of these underlying um, maybe less visible to the mainstream society, but certainly present for, for a lot of communities. And I think that becoming more visible has been one thing that's driven a conversation around inclusion. I think um, to that also the, the organizations that have been called upon for a long time to take action in this space, um, patience is running out and it's time to be doing something that moves the needle for real. And um, I think those that kind of intersection of the tech and culture is just spiked um, in the last five years as well, um, back to, you know, just just simply how many people are now participating um, with mobile devices and the, the instances we're seeing where there's a real impact of exclusion or impact of um, not being able to use uh, products in an equitable way. Um, and then I'd, I'd say also that there's there's a rise in communities and individuals offering up solutions. And a lot of times these are people who have experienced exclusion for a long time in their own ways and are now in leadership positions and bringing those solutions to light in a way that can be connected to a broader audience. Um, so I would say that, that those are some of the things. And then the second part of your question is it? What do you think, an, how would you define an inclusive mindset? Oh. Oh, I want to hear what, what uh, <laughs> panelists have to say. I, I, would, I would say that just really quickly, um, our default is an exclusive mindset, primarily, for the most part. It's just kind of built in, especially in some cultures, um, that, you know, this protection of things that we want to, like, shut, shut other people out from, from having. It starts really young. It starts, like, kindergarten age. And so um, I would say that the, the practice of constantly working to offset that exclusive mindset is the inclusive muscle, I'd say, to build. So muscle has to counteract that, that deeply ingrained cultural mindset that we have around exclusion. Love to. So I wanted to tackle the mindset one first. Uh, I thought about this a little bit. To me, uh, the inclusion mindset is one that is very humble, right, that has humility and that realizes that um, you realize that you don't have all the answers, that there's some blind spots that you know, you're not even going to be aware of. And so starting from that perspective is that there's no way for me to know everything. I'm probably missing something. Um, I think it's the beginning. Um, in terms of what has kind of one of the things that's contributed to like us spending a lot more time talking about this, I think uh, machine learning has a lot to do with that. Um, the sort of, sort of, you know, conversations that I'm having within a corporation. I've been in corporate, working in corporations for like 30 years. And the sort of conversations that I have working on ML fairness and ethical AI within a corporation, um, they still shock me, right? Because the fact that the machines are reflecting what society is telling it um, is forcing us to reckon with these questions um, in a serious way. Um, one reason is because there is you know, business on the line, um, but I see it as like an, a, a really great opening to have conversations that weren't happening, um, that need to be happening. And I think the one shift that I saw definitely within Google and also across the industry as a whole, um, in terms of changing those blank stares into actually being interested in it, in the topic, I think for many people, inclusion and diversity, when we were talking largely about balanced teams and why do you need different perspectives, seemed very much like this is the right thing to do and that's why we should be doing it. And there wasn't that emotional connection 
or connection back to metrics that they were trying to move, which allowed to bring in that empathy as they were doing product design. And the shift that I definitely have been getting behind and in, in conversations and dialogues to uh, drive Google's focus, and that has expanded outside the, in, the world, in the tech industry as well, is to say, yes, maybe it is the right thing to do or it's not, who knows, right? Um, so let's not talk about it from that angle, but from a business point of view, is there growth that you're giving up by not having an inclusive mindset or by having exclusions into your framework that you're not even aware of. So the unconscious bias that you are bringing to the table in your product design, is that leaving a lot of consumers that who could be engaging with your products not actually engaging or creating an unsafe environment where it wouldn't, right? So, and we've been pulling examples across not just tech, but other industries over time, over the years, where we've seen reactive inclusive thinking, how it has addressed gaps and opened up markets. So a classic example is the, um, uh, you know, the airbag safety in cars. So when they first launched airbags, it turned out that it was more uh, unsafe and caused more deaths with women than men. And they really didn't understand why that was happening until they actually, uh, the team kind of reshifted its thinking and started looking at the testing that they were doing with airbags and realized all the models that they were using for the testing were men, male, modeled after men. And women's body type is just very different. So when you put women in a real car crash, the risk of injuries was like, I think 40% higher for women than men. So once they changed how that design was done, suddenly airbags became a safe thing. Like none of us have cars without an airbag anymore. So I think that kind of examples um, has helped people think in terms of metrics. So even within YouTube, we optimize for watch time. So when you look at watch time, it just keeps growing and growing. But when you go one level deeper and say, let's look at the demographic data, whether it's ethnicity or gender-based, and see, are we leaving segments of the population out? Then you suddenly, there's an aha moment and say, OK, I'm missing out on all these engagement opportunities on the platform. We really should be addressing that. So it truly does accelerate growth of your products and revenue. Um, not to say that's the only thing that's important, but I think that helps make it more tangible when you're running a business and when you have to prioritize with constrained resources. Yeah. So I'm just taking my job because that was the next question, but that's okay. Um, so are there any other surprising or interesting products or solutions or examples um, that you've run into that anyone wants to jump in with? That's <laughs> um, I, so there's all sorts of in our daily lives, things that were invented and created at first to resolve some kind of exclusion. And some of my favorite examples are um, keyboards. The first typewriters were created, um, actually one of the very first ones created uh, between a inventor and a good friend of his um, who, uh, the, some people rumored that they were lovers. So uh, when they were apart, they wanted to stay in communication. But um, the, the countess, um, his, his dear friend was blind. And so to, in order to author your own letters, and this was like in the 1800s, you usually had to dictate it to somebody else who would write it down for you. Um, and the two of them worked together to invent the first prototype of a typewriter. Um, and so, you know, we've all benefited from those keyboard designs. Um, flexible straws, another one that started as a design for exclusion that then has benefited many more people. Um, email. Uh, captioning in our, our videos, um, audiobooks, like across the board. And there's a broad range of these stories that these, you know, these products live quietly in our environments. Um, and we may not even know that that's how they originated. Um, so we're, I think we're seeing also this new wave of um, solutions now coming from different companies as we think about the enterprise environment, the way that, um, you know, people, the hiring processes you know, taking a closer look at how people move through a hiring process and the things that we emphasize, the abilities and the um, characteristics that we emphasize, and companies starting to revisit and evaluate that. Um, the workplace itself, the communication tools that we use. So you see all these interesting little places where they start almost, to your point on being humble, Donald, and like these humble innovations that then take root and 
really propagate quietly sometimes. They don't need to be marketed the highest level. They can be something that just really makes a difference and then sticks for people. So I, lo I love, there's so many examples to, to just look around and, and draw from. Yeah, I could. I mean, I think the, the one that comes to me is like the emojis. You know, we all are texting all the time. We're using them. And we all were just taking it for granted that they were all kind of yellow-looking emojis with blonde hair. And, and even though it looks nothing like me, like I was doing the thumbs up with it and everything, right? And it took a group of design experts within Google when we were go doing this whole inclusive design hackathons across Google to say, hey, like, let's take a pause and say, what if we introduced more wide variety of these uh, to represent men and women, girls and boys, in more non-stereotypical roles, and also allow you to pick different skin and hair color options when you're doing these. So a simple thing like thumbs up, you can choose now the skin color that you want in it, and it's just pretty amazing. And suddenly now, it, it just feels more connected to the user, which I think is such a simple idea if you think about it, but it had been overlooked for so many years, and we all were OK using it. So I think that's a very powerful example. Yeah, and I, I will say, I know there were a few non-tech examples that we've talked about before. Does someone want to talk about the any of the yeah. non -tech? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about movies. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple that I thought about. One was Black Panther, right? So that was, you know, uh, it broke all sorts of records, and uh, a lot of people wouldn't have expected that. So I think it opened up a lot of opportunities just by it being more inclusive and showing a whole different perspective on the world. And then the other one is I just saw the movie, uh, the horror film Us, uh, which again was one kind of, uh, another one of those movies told, told from a different perspective um, that's breaking all sorts of records um, and kind of opening you know, uh, places in the field just by having, it, by, by letting folks that have been excluded from those venues to be part of it. Um, and then the final one is, uh, is I like movies, uh, <laughs> Mo Moonlight. Um, I saw that a couple of years ago, and the way that that movie basically, you know, included um, African Americans, uh, issues with bullying, um, LGBTQ, like all that in one movie, I was shocked by how they did that, and how I'm sure they brought all sorts of people together in a movie theater that aren't typically together. Uh, my kids love this movie, Coco. And I think it came out very much for the LATAM population in the, uh, in, I think that's how they thought about it when they made the movie. But to their surprise, it's actually done really well, not just here and for the audience they targeted, but also in APAC. And when they dug, when they were digging into that to find out like, why is it that it's working, even though it has nothing to do with any Asian culture in there, it's because I think just seeing the representation of someone who's not always portrayed in movies results in a connection that then allows other audience to start engaging. And so I think that's another non-tech example. Just to add on, um, one thing that, that Pixar did, and, and just to the films, because I love, it's such a great example of uh, how films have shifted. And one thing that Pixar did I thought was really interesting is they were looking for how, they started with, they, we're committed to inclusive, inclusion, we're committed to diversity, and we're looking around, we don't see directors. We don't know many directors who might represent the communities that we're looking to tell stories. And they, they had to take a hard look at how they were curating movie stories. Like they had to say, they had to look at maybe how using a shorts program, like the short films and opening those up to anybody inside of Pixar who was in any role inside that company could contribute an idea for a short film. And it fundamentally changed who started to show up and say, I have a story to tell. And you see a lot of stories drawn from personal experience. But then it's about growing the skills through the story, right? And so that fundamentally then changed who became a director. So starting with looking at how they reshaped the, the process, and it, it then shaped who could show up, and then it shaped what stories made it to the, to, you know, the theaters. I think that's great. I love that. I think that's really important, too, just thinking about the holistic process, right? Like, it's not just one piece 
of the process that's important. It's like, who's telling the story, right? How are they telling the story? And what language are you localizing it versus just translating it, right? Like, there are a lot of pieces where you can bring an inclusive lens to building a product or service. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we touched on this a little bit um, in the overview, but when we think about underrepresented users, many times, um, the narrative is that these are very small populations and so they should be deprioritized when we know that that's not necessarily true. So how do we start to shift the narrative that um, inclusive design or product inclusion is core to the business versus just a nice to have? Uh, one, one tool that's worked really well, I've found, is um, you know, finding that connection based on interaction. Like, you know, and this is where I, I tend to talk about ability first, but there's lots of different lenses that this could be applied through. But thinking about um, you know, designing something for someone who was born with one arm. I'd say, okay, maybe you know, only eight million people in the United States, have, or you know, even fewer, like maybe eight million people in the world have been born with one arm. Um, seems like a relatively small percentage of the population. But if you design a solution that works well for someone who's born, born with one arm, then it also works well for someone who's got an arm injury and is temporarily unable to use um, one of their arms, or who is carrying a bag of groceries or a newborn infant. And so finding these connections based on what is it you're actually trying to solve? Like what's the, the interaction that you're trying to, uh, the connection you're trying to make, the, the solution that you're trying to put out in the world? And then what is the kind of um, extended benefit that could reach more people? And I, I think that in particular design thrives on good, strong constraints. And that's why understanding what types of exclusion exist in the products and solutions we make gives us a good starting point and then saying, okay, if we were to design this really well for somebody who did not have the economic resources to participate in this I don't know, bank loan application process, let's go understand the, the language barriers people have as they're applying for you know, uh, immigration status through an online tool. Let's go start with that as the design starting point. And if you make that work well, you will very much so benefit anyone who's looking to interact with that system because you've solved for kind of the core need that, that it needs to address. Um, so that strong constraint, I think, is one way to draw the connection from a business case standpoint, that you solve it well and you will be able to reach a broader market, but you just have to think about your markets beyond maybe your traditional marketing demographic categories and more about the behavior and interaction that people are using when they come to use your products and services. And I think also to add to that, it's about Sometimes the numbers may not be big right now, but it's what's projected in the future. So you showed a slide earlier on saying, like, what is a future usage that's going to happen? So this definitely happened for us and Google as we were looking at um, the next billion user efforts, right? So when we were saying, you know, we are very, we are a global company and which markets do we want to start building and optimizing products for, there are markets which don't seem big right now, but the rate of growth of, for instance, mobile penetration is so high that you know, even though the number is small today, in three years from now or five years from now, it's gonna outpace um, like a whole country some, somewhere else. So I think it's really important to know what, to your point of constraints, what is it that you're optimizing for and how long is your roadmap, and then work your way through. Because none of us have unlimited resources. You do need to prioritize. And I, I think the whole thing about inclusive design is not so much that on day one or your V1 of your product, you have to solve it for everybody and anybody out there, but to be very intentional about who your target users are and be aware that who are the people that you're serving and not serving and who would be the next set of people that you need to address as you evolve your design. Because it's an iterative process and you, you kind of have to prioritize it with the metrics in mind. Yeah, I think this, uh, kind of what Kat said, I think it boils down to, you know, if you're going to, if you want to solve for inclusion, you, sh you need to start with a deep understanding of exclusion. And so, um, taking the opportunity to actually look for needs within these populations of people that are excluded versus the traditional, you know, uh, you know, you know, who has the right socioeconomic status for me to uh, target because I think they're gonna be able to afford this. Look for problems in different places 
And when you solve problems for those people, you're going to end up solving problems for people who didn't, you didn't expect you would solve, it, solve uh, those problems for. Uh, so I think that's one key thing. And then I think the other thing is to start to shift the mindset in terms of uh, your sources of expertise. So if you're in a room and everyone looks like you, you probably don't have a good idea of what the problems are out there that need to be solved. Um, I think that's like, you know, starting to view uh, folks that are in these excluded groups as valuable sources of expertise, invaluable sources of expertise, is the sort of mind shift that I think needs to take place. Awesome. I'm going to skip through a few questions so we make sure that we have time for Q&A. Um, so, Kat, in your book, you talk about reducing customer churn uh, when we emphasize human diversity in our process and products. So, would love to hear you speak a little bit more about that. So, can you say the first part again? I didn't hear you. Sure. This is when my voice starts. No, no, it's good. It's, it's <laughs> so, your writing talks about reducing customer churn oh. when we emphasize human diversity. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah, I think. Um, you know, there's several several ways to look at that. I think um, human diversity is often categorized in particular ways. It's almost the same list that we move through. And you know, I, I grew up in in Oakland, and diversity was a, a, a very common part of conversation uh, throughout my education. But we always kind of focused on this, you know, same groupings of people, the same ways of thinking about people, and. Um, and so when we talk about how somebody interacts in the world, um, there's something that opened up for me. There's something that shifted there. Um, and the World Health Organization uh, redefined disability in 2001. Well, they, they published a definition that existed for a long time, but they, they defined disability as a mismatched interaction between the features of a person's body and the features of the environment in which they live. And what stuck for me about that is, you know, we as people who make choices about interactions and how those are designed and, you know, somebody comes and experiences the things we make, that every choice is either increasing or decreasing those mismatches. So when I think about churn, is like how long can you expect somebody to endure and interact with a mismatch before they just feel like it's not for them? And, or they're just straight up tired of <laughs> putting up with it. And so, um, understanding those kind of mismatches to a degree that we can um, then bring somebody into the process, the design process, and what are the workarounds, what are, to your point on expertise, what are the um, skills and expertise that you use um, to navigate all of that complexity um, is, is a real uh, strength. So one example is um, in game console design, um, for a very long time the controllers uh, have been pretty much it, you know, iterations of the same thing, the same kind of shape. You can kind of picture, I'm pretending to hold one up, but um, almost all of the controllers since the beginning of console gaming have required two hands to play in some fashion. And um, there is a whole community of gamers who are so committed to playing that they have created complex workarounds, custom software, custom tools um, to, to game. And the, there's quite a few companies now that are bringing, um, you know, disabled veterans or disabled gamers into their design process. Say, well, how did you figure that thing out? Like, how did you create that, you know, code in the background? How did you create that that rig to fit your body? And then let's go think about how to design that for more people. And I think that that's easy in a place where people not easy, but it's when somebody really wants to play, they will go to those lengths. It's almost like a game itself to just play the game. And there's so much richness and also a real hardship in, in creating that. Um, but when we think about a place where somebody may not be so patient with us, right? They may have this you know, application for sending, I don't know, email or this hiring process. How many steps do we have to make people go through on a website before they can just have a conversation with somebody? You know, what are we really designing for in that hiring process? So, the point on churn is more so that understanding all those little places where it's a big, small, or medium mismatches, uh, if we can address those, it helps move people through the experience to really get to what it is they want to, like what they want to bring and how they want to play. So, yeah, I'd love to hear about your pioneering inclusive design at YouTube and if you can give any examples of what you've worked on. Um, so I think I touched on some already in previous answers. Um, so some of the things that we've done, I think one, I, I, maybe we can pull the slide up, 
is like uh, we started YouTube Kids. So I, I helped start YouTube Kids. And at that time, we were uh, first trying to say, like, we know kids use YouTube. We know families use YouTube. Do you really need an app designed for kids? And then so we brought kids into our UX lab. This was the first time we had kids in Google in a UX lab, had to get a lot of approvals and permission. And once we got them in and gave them YouTube, what we noticed was they didn't care about anything on the screen other than just the video that was playing. All this attribution about the creator, the navigation bar, and the menus and things, it was all like blah, blah, blah for them. Like really all they cared about was the video, which is when we said, OK, look, like you need to go back to the drawing board and think about how will YouTube be if you were to design this for kids from the get-go. And we made this a very visually rich experience. And we also focused a lot on safety because we wanted to give it to families and make sure that parents were comfortable allowing kids at that age group to watch. So we addressed a lot of algorithmic um, filtering and content rating issues. And it's still work in progress. There's so much more to be done. Um, and also re-pivoted how the visual design was. And to Kat's point, like when you solve for one community, you inevitably end up solving for others. So when we actually started demoing YouTube Kids, there was so much interest across Google for like, they were like, why is it just for kids? Even like, I might prefer a more visually rich experience than something where I have to click so many different places. Or uh, the senior population who aren't going to be reading so much, maybe we should make it more voice-based because we had voice-based navigation as front and center in the YouTube Kids app, uh, knowing that kids may not be ready yet to type or read. So, they're like, why not look at that from that angle? So definitely that was one example. Another one which I think has uh, been a very sensitive topic in the tech industry as a whole is the gaming industry. Uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with Gamergate? Um, yeah, many seem to be raising their hands. But so basically like women gamers getting abused uh, and harassed through online comments and hashtags and just the online community space. And so we did like an all women's hackathon in YouTube, not just from tech, but in bringing in people across policy, the whole cross-functional group. And when we did that, what was really interesting to see is th there was a group of combination of engineers, policy, and support that came together and came up with an idea for how could comments on YouTube have better moderation controls that will allow creators to protect themselves against harassment like this. And a few years later, we've actually launched all these features, which has improved the product, not just for women gamers, but also on the whole for all of YouTube creators as a whole. Awesome. And final question, and then we'll have people, if they have questions, start lining up at the mics. Um, Donald, can you tell us about if there's a linkage between machine learning fairness and product inclusion and how you see that overlap or opportunities for collaboration? Yeah, I do see a linkage. So I, I've said this a couple times, but I, I, so on the ML fairness, you know, in order to solve for fairness, you need to have a deep understanding of an unfairness. And um, a, a lot of the unfairness that we see is manifested in exclusion, right? And so that's that's the linkage that I see, see between the two. And I spend a lot of time on, um, you know, what's going to be the social impact of a product? How do you think about that ahead of time? And so one of the things that we're trying to think about is think of the, the product that you're introducing, think of it as some sort of intervention uh, on a larger system. Um, and when you think about it that way, you have to think about who's going to be impacted by it other than you um, and other than the people you might be targeting. Um, and oftentimes those conversations don't happen until it's too late. So we're trying to say, okay, let's have those conversations early. Um, and in order to have those conversations, you need to bring in people that have totally different perspectives. So the YouTube example is perfect. It's like, what do the kids see? They see something totally different. People from excluded communities are gonna see the same thing that you're looking at in a totally different way. You need to understand how they're seeing it so that when you roll something out, you're not inadvertently excluding them, harming them. Um, and so that's where I see the linkage between the two because I focus on, you know, how do you set up the adversarial testing for male fairness? Some of the same things can be applied to how do you create an product, uh, inclusive product. Awesome. Uh, and I know we're at time before I get the mean face from the back. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I hope this was helpful. So thanks for your time.